Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. For the past few videos, we've been talking about spectroscopy. We've looked at both rotational and vibrational spectroscopy, and what motions are happening in molecules to produce peaks in spectra. We saw that, in order to produce a signal in both rotational and vibrational spectra, the electric dipole moment of the molecule needs to change its magnitude or direction. But how do we know whether the electric dipole moment is changing? To figure that out, we need to know about the symmetry of the molecule. This actually isn't as simple as it sounds. You can look at molecules like these and see that they're all symmetric in some ways. But if you look carefully, you can see that the kind of symmetry isn't really the same in each of them. In order to understand whether the electric dipole moments change in these molecules when they rotate or vibrate, we need to pin down exactly what the different types of symmetry are and how we can recognize them in different molecules. This is actually a branch of mathematics called group theory, and you'll have a chance to take a whole course in group theory in grad school if you're interested in it. In order to talk about the symmetry of a molecule, or a galaxy, or a flower, or anything else, the first thing we need to do is talk about symmetry elements. A symmetry element is an imaginary reference point in the molecule or object that gives the object its symmetry. For example, take this person's face. His face is very symmetrical. The left and right sides are very similar. We can imagine a plane dividing his face into two halves. That mirror plane would be a symmetry element. It's an imaginary plane that gives an object its symmetry. Now, look at this flower. The symmetry here is imperfect because the flower petals are each a little bit different from each other. But if you ignore those slight differences, you can see that the flower is very symmetrical. Just like the person's face we just looked at, you could place an imaginary mirror through the center of the flower, and the left and right sides would be nearly identical. But this flower is actually much more symmetric than that. For example, we could also place a mirror through the flower in a horizontal direction. The top and bottom halves are again nearly identical, so this flower has two mirror planes. But there's even more. We don't have to limit ourselves to the horizontal or vertical directions. We could also imagine placing a mirror diagonally. Anywhere where there are two petals on opposite sides of the flower, we could place a mirror that would divide the flower into two roughly identical halves. That means there are actually many different mirror planes in the flower, and each of them is a different symmetry element. But that's not all. If each of the flower petals were identical, you could imagine rotating this flower so that each petal rotates and ends up in the position where the petal next to it used to be. When we do this, we can imagine that there's an invisible axis going through the center of the flower, and the flower rotates around that axis. That makes the axis another symmetry element. It's an imaginary line in the flower that gives it some of its symmetry. So, this flower has lots of symmetry elements, an axis of rotation, and several different mirror planes. By now you should be getting a sense of what we mean when we talk about symmetry elements. Let's make it a bit more concrete by actually making a list of the different types of symmetry element, and we'll use some real molecules to give us an idea of what symmetry elements are like for atoms and molecules. Every symmetry element tells us what we must do to the object in order to make the object look the same as when we started. So, for example, to make this person's face look the same as when we started, we must reflect the image in the vertical mirror plane. In order to make the flower look the same, one of the things we can do is rotate it around an axis. The action we must take, such as reflecting or rotating, is called a symmetry operation. It turns out that there are seven different types of symmetry element that we could have in a molecule. Let's look at each of them. The first symmetry element is the simplest one of all. In fact, it seems almost kind of silly to include it on our list, but we'll soon see that it's sometimes important to use it. The first symmetry element is known as the identity element, and it has the symbol E. 
The symmetry operation we perform with the symmetry element is simply to do nothing to the object. Of course, when we do nothing to an object, it continues to look exactly the same as when we started. So that means every object has the identity element, no matter how non-symmetric the object is otherwise. All these molecules have the identity element. This flower and the man's face have the identity element as one of their symmetry elements, and so does this piece of coral, even though it's a very unsymmetric object. The next symmetry element is called a proper axis. It's an axis that we can rotate the object around so that it eventually looks the same as when we began. If you imagine we could rotate the object a full 360 degrees, then we'd need to go 360 degrees divided by n before the object looks the same. So, for example, we have to rotate the water molecule by 180 degrees, which is 360 divided by 2. So in this case, n is 2. The same is true for this hydrogen peroxide molecule. We have to rotate it 180 degrees, so n is 2. For the benzene molecule, there's an axis that goes through the middle of the ring, and for this one, n is 6 because we have to rotate the molecule 60 degrees, which is 360 divided by 6. Methane has an axis here, and we must rotate the molecule by 120 degrees, which means n is equal to 3. The symbol for this symmetry element is C with a subscript n. So the symmetry element for water and hydrogen peroxide has the symbol C2. For benzene, it's C6. And for methane, it's C3. Notice that molecules can have more than one rotation axis. For example, the benzene also has some other rotation axes. There's a rotation axis here that goes through two of the carbon-hydrogen bonds. That one is a C2 axis. There's another C2 axis between these two carbon-hydrogen bonds, and another one between these two carbon-hydrogen bonds. There's also a C2 axis that passes between the two carbon-carbon bonds. And there are two more C2 axes, one between these carbon-carbon bonds, and another one between these bonds. In cases like this, where a molecule has more than one axis of rotation, the axis with the highest value of n is called the major axis. So, in the case of benzene, the major axis is the C6 axis. Also, in this example, not only is the C6 axis of benzene the major axis, it's also a C3 axis because we could rotate the molecule one-third of the way around the axis and end up with something that looks exactly like what we started with. It's also a C2 axis, because we could rotate the molecule 180 degrees around it. So this one axis is a C6 axis, a C3 axis, and also a C2 axis. The next type of symmetry element is a plane of reflection. There are actually three different types of mirror plane. The first one is called a horizontal plane, which has the symbol sigma with a subscript h. A horizontal mirror plane is one that's perpendicular to the major axis of the molecule. So, for example, benzene has a mirror plane perpendicular to the C6 axis, which is the major axis and that makes it a sigma h plane. This mirror plane is the one that contains the benzene molecule. On the other hand, let's look at water. The major axis is this C2 axis, and the plane perpendicular to it is this one. However, if we reflect the molecule in that plane, we don't get something that looks exactly the same as what we started with. The hydrogens now point down instead of up, so this plane is not a symmetry element of the water molecule. 
That means water does not have a horizontal mirror plane. The second type of mirror plane is a vertical mirror plane, which has the symbol sigma v. In this one, instead of being perpendicular to the major axis, the plane contains the mirror axis. So, for example, if we reflect a water molecule in this plane, we get a molecule that looks just like the one we started with. This plane also contains the major axis of the molecule, so that makes it a vertical mirror plane. Notice that we could also reflect the water molecule in this plane, which is the plane that contains the molecule. This is another vertical mirror plane because it contains the C2 axis of the molecule. Now let's look at benzene. Benzene contains several vertical mirror planes. There are three vertical planes that contain opposite pairs of carbon-hydrogen bonds. There are also three vertical planes that go between carbon-carbon atoms on opposite sides of the molecule for a total of six vertical planes in benzene. And this brings us to our third type of mirror plane, which is called a dihedral mirror plane and has the symbol sigma d. This one can be tricky to identify. A dihedral mirror plane is a special case of vertical mirror plane where the plane bisects two C2 axes in the molecule. That's kind of hard to visualize without an example, so let's look at benzene again. Here's one of the vertical mirror planes we saw earlier. From our discussion of rotation axes, we saw that benzene has these two C2 axes. The vertical plane bisects those two axes, so that makes it a dihedral plane as well as being a vertical plane. In fact, all six of the vertical planes in benzene are also dihedral planes because all of them bisect two different C2 axes in the molecule. So now we've looked at five different symmetry elements, the identity element, the proper axis, and three different kinds of mirror plane. The next symmetry element is called a center of inversion, and it has the symbol I. For this symmetry element, we find the spot in the exact center of the molecule and move each atom to a coordinate on the exact opposite side of the molecule. In other words, if we imagine a Cartesian coordinate system with its origin at the middle of the molecule, we reverse the sign on the x, y, and z coordinates for each atom in the molecule. For example, here's a methane molecule. The carbon atom is the center of the molecule, so that's where we put the origin of the coordinate system. If we reverse the sign on the top hydrogen, it ends up below the carbon. The other three hydrogens also end up on the opposite side of the molecule from where they started. The hydrogens were below the carbon, and now they're above. Also, hydrogens that used to be toward the front of the molecule are now toward the back and hydrogens that were on the left are now on the right. As you can see, the result of this operation is that we end up with a molecule that looks different than the one that we started with. So that means methane does not have a center of inversion as one of its symmetry elements. But now, let's look at benzene again. The center of the benzene molecule is in the middle of the ring. If we move each atom to the opposite side of the molecule, here's what we get. The carbons on opposite sides of the ring exchanged places, and so did the hydrogens. The result is a molecule that looks exactly like the one we started with. So that means that benzene does have a center of inversion. There's one more symmetry element left. It's called an improper axis of rotation and has the symbol S with a subscript N. Just as with the proper axis, the N tells us how much we have to rotate the molecule. But the difference between this and a proper axis is that after rotating the molecule, we reflect it in a plane perpendicular to the axis. 
So, for example, in benzene, we can rotate the molecule 180 degrees around this axis and then reflect it in a plane perpendicular to the axis. When we do that, the molecule looks the same as it did when we started. So that means this axis is an S2 improper axis. There are several other improper axes in benzene, including the axis that goes through the center of the ring. This one is an S6 axis. And just as we saw when we looked at proper axes, the S6 axis is also an S3 axis and an S2 axis. Finally, let's look at one last example, methane. There are several improper axes in methane, but they can be difficult to see. Let's position the molecule this way so that two of the hydrogens point up and two of them point down. Imagine an axis that goes directly between the two upper hydrogen atoms through the carbon and emerges between the two lower hydrogen atoms. We can rotate the molecule one-fourth of the way around this axis. And now we reflect the molecule in a plane perpendicular to the axis. When we do, we get a molecule that looks exactly like the methane molecule we started with. That means methane has an S4 improper axis. In fact, it has three different S4 improper axes, depending on which pairs of hydrogens we choose as the ones through which to place the axis. So, why are all these symmetry elements interesting to chemists? Well, it turns out we can learn a lot about the spectra of molecules by thinking about the symmetry elements. For example, it turns out that if a molecule has a major axis, there can't be an electric dipole moment in a direction perpendicular to the major axis. If the molecule does have an electric dipole moment, it must be in a direction along the axis and not perpendicular to it. So, for example, Here's the molecule chloromethane. It has a major axis here along the carbon-chlorine bond. That means that its electric dipole moment can't be perpendicular to that bond. Instead, it must be along the axis. We can see that if we show the charge distribution in the molecule. In this picture, positive charges are blue and negative ones are red you can see that the positive and negative ends of the molecule are along the proper axis, so that's the direction of the electric dipole moment. If a molecule has both a major axis and a horizontal mirror plane, then the molecule must be completely nonpolar. For example, benzene, which we've looked at several times already, has a major axis and also a horizontal plane. That means benzene is a nonpolar molecule. However, as we'll see in the next video, the shape of a molecule can change when it vibrates. So although the equilibrium shape of benzene is nonpolar, some vibrations may change the shape of the molecule so that it has an electric dipole moment. One other thing we can learn from the symmetry elements in a molecule has to do with stereochemistry. It turns out that a chiral molecule can't possibly have a center of inversion or an improper rotational axis. We'll see some examples of this in just a little while. As you might realize already, a molecular model kit can be very helpful when you're trying to identify what symmetry elements a molecule contains. We can make it a little easier by grouping molecules together according to which symmetry elements they have. It turns out that many molecules have the exact same symmetry elements. For example, it turns out that ammonia and chloromethane each have a C3 proper axis and three vertical mirror planes. For that reason, we can put them in the same group. Aside from making it easier to keep track of which molecules have similar symmetry elements, there's another more practical reason for grouping molecules according to the symmetry elements they have.
it turns out that molecules in the same group have similar spectroscopic properties. The groups I'm referring to are called point groups, and there are quite a few of them. To keep them straight, we'll make a flowchart. When you're trying to decide what point group a molecule belongs to, the flowchart we're making might come in handy. I'll give you a copy of it in our class. The first thing to do is decide whether it belongs to a very easy to recognize group. The easy to recognize groups can be one of three different types. The first type is the low symmetry groups. These are molecules that have very few symmetry elements, and there are three different low symmetry groups. First, there are molecules that have no symmetry elements other than E, the identity element. In other words, they have no rotational axes, no mirror planes, and no center of inversion. For example, here's a molecule that you probably first saw when you first started talking about chiral molecules in your organic chemistry course. It's called bromochlorofluoromethane. So it's a carbon with a hydrogen, fluorine, chlorine, and bromine atom each bonded to it. This molecule doesn't have an axis of rotation, a mirror plane, or a center of inversion. In fact, there's no operation we can perform on this molecule that will end with it looking the same as it does now. With one exception, we can perform the identity operation in which we do nothing to the molecule. As you might recall, that's what we do with E, the identity element. So E is the only symmetry element in this molecule. Molecules like this one belong to a point group called C1. There are actually quite a lot of large molecules that also belong to this group. For example, most proteins belong to the C1 point group because they're very asymmetric. Also, many complex molecules like morphine and testosterone don't have any symmetry elements other than E, so they also belong to the C1 point group. The next low symmetry point group is one in which the only symmetry elements are E and a mirror plane. This point group is called the CS group. An example of this would be the molecule Z1 bromo. 1 fluoro, 2 chloroethene. Aside from E, the only symmetry element this molecule has is a mirror plane that includes the plane of the molecule. Since that's the only symmetry element, this molecule belongs to the CS group. The third and final low symmetry point group is one that has only E and a center of inversion as its symmetry elements and it has the symbol CI. This is actually a pretty rare point group, but one example is 1R2S12-dichloro-12-difluoroethane. When it's in its anti-conformation, the molecule looks like this. The only symmetry element, other than E, is a center of inversion. Inverting this molecule causes the two carbons to switch places, and also the two hydrogens, the two fluorines, and the two chlorines. There are no axes of rotation or mirror planes, so this belongs to the CI point group. This is one that might be easiest to see if you can build a model of your own. So those are the three low symmetry point groups, C1, CS, and CI. The next type of easy-to-recognize point group is linear molecules. There are just two point groups for linear molecules. All linear molecules have their major axis along the bonds that form the line of the molecule. The first of the two point groups is for molecules that have a horizontal mirror plane. That means the two sides of the molecule are mirror images of each other. For example, all homonuclear diatomic molecules, such as H2 or O2, belong to this point group, which has the symbol D infinity H.
Carbon dioxide and acetylene are two other examples of molecules in this point group because, like H2 and O2, they can be reflected in a horizontal mirror plane. The other linear point group is one that doesn't have a horizontal mirror plane. This one has the symbol C infinity V, and this group includes all the heteronuclear diatomic molecules, like carbon monoxide and HCl. Another example is the molecule hydrogen cyanide, HCN. The third and final type of easy to recognize point group is groups with very high symmetry. There are actually several of these point groups, but we'll just worry about three of them. The first is the tetrahedral point group, which has the symbol TD. This is the point group that methane belongs to. Basically, it's for tetrahedral molecules where each of the four points of the tetrahedron are identical to each other. The second high symmetry point group is for octahedral molecules, and it has the symbol OH. As the name implies, this is for octahedral molecules where each of the six points of the octahedron are identical. Finally, the third high symmetry point group is for icosahedral molecules, and it has the symbol IH. An icosahedron is a 20-sided shape. People who have played role-playing games might be familiar with 20-sided dice. An icosahedral molecule has the same kind of symmetry. The most well-known example is C60, also called Buckminster Fullerene, or a buckyball. So, that takes care of the easy-to-recognize point groups. Now for the other groups. To identify those, the first thing we need to do is to identify the major axis of the molecule. Once we've done that, we ask the question, are there any C2 axes perpendicular to the major axis? If there are, then we know that the molecule must belong to one of several D point groups. In that case, the next question to ask is whether or not the molecule has a horizontal mirror plane. If it does, then the molecule belongs to the point group DNH, where the N is the order of the major axis. One example of this would be our old friend benzene. Its major axis is the C6 axis. It has a horizontal mirror plane and also has C2 axes perpendicular to the major axis. So that means benzene belongs to the D6H point group. On the other hand, if the molecule does not have horizontal mirror planes, then the next question is whether it has any dihedral mirror planes. If it does, then it belongs to the point group DND, where the N is the order of the major axis. This is another fairly rare point group, but one good example is ethane in its staggered conformation. In this case, the major axis is a C3 axis passing along the carbon-carbon bond. It has three C2 axes perpendicular to the main axis, and also has mirror planes that bisect some of the C2 axes. That makes them dihedral mirror planes and that means this molecule belongs to the D3D point group. If the molecule doesn't have any dihedral planes, then it belongs to the Dn point group, again with n equal to the order of the major axis. An example of this would be the ion where nickel 2 plus has three oxalate groups chelated to it. The major axis in this one can be difficult to see, but it's a C3 axis right here. If we look down the axis, the symmetry of it is easier to see. In this case, you can see that rotating the molecule 120 degrees around the axis will cause the molecule to look the same as it did before the rotation. The molecule does have perpendicular C2 axes, but it doesn't have a horizontal mirror plane or any dihedral mirror plane. So that means this molecule belongs to the D3 point group.
Now we can look at the other branch in our flowchart. If there are not any C2 axes perpendicular to the major axis, our molecule must belong to one of several C or S point groups. Just as when we were in the other branch of the flowchart, the next question to ask is, does the molecule have a horizontal mirror plane? If it does, then the molecule belongs to the C and H point group. An example of this would be trans-1,2-dichloroethane. This molecule has a C2 major axis and also has a horizontal mirror plane, but it doesn't have any perpendicular C2 axes. That means this molecule belongs to the C2H point group. If the molecule doesn't have a horizontal plane, then the next question is whether or not it has any vertical planes. If it does, then the molecule belongs to a C and V point group. There are lots of molecules that fall into this category. For example, water has a C2 major axis. It doesn't have any C2 axes perpendicular to the major one, nor does it have a horizontal mirror plane. But it does have vertical mirror planes. That means water belongs to the C2V point group. If the molecule doesn't have any vertical mirror planes, there's one last question to ask. Is the major axis also an improper axis? If it is, then the molecule belongs to the point group S2N. This is another rare kind of point group. One of the examples is 1357-tetrachloro-1357-octatetrine with a boat conformation and all the chlorines in axial positions. The major axis in this molecule is a C2 axis passing through the middle of the ring. There are no perpendicular C2 axes and no horizontal mirror planes. There are also no vertical planes. That might not be obvious at first, but it's true because of the locations of the double bonds in the ring. Finally, the major axis is also an S4 improper axis. If we rotate the molecule by one quarter turn, then reflect the molecule in a plane perpendicular to the axis, we get this, which looks the same as the molecule we had when we started. That means this molecule belongs to the S4 point group. If the major axis is not also an improper axis, that means the molecule belongs to the Cn point group. For example, consider hydrogen peroxide. This molecule has a C2 major axis, but it doesn't have any perpendicular axes, doesn't have a horizontal or vertical mirror plane, and its major axis is not also an improper axis. That means this molecule belongs to the C2 point group. So, now we know all the different point groups that a molecule can belong to. We'll get lots of practice figuring out the point groups that different molecules belong to in class and in the next video. If you find it hard to visualize some of these symmetry elements, I really recommend getting a molecular model kit if you don't have one already. But that's enough material for today. In the next video, we'll practice what we've learned today and also find out how all this relates to spectroscopy. It might seem a bit abstract right now, but we'll soon see that point groups can be vital information when we want to interpret IR spectra and other kinds of spectra. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.